Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome to another episode of Two Bros and a Joe. I'm Brother Tacho. And I'm Brother George. And we have Brother Tony back behind the camera, running the camera. Hello. And uh, again, we're doing Two Bros and a Joe. What you may notice tonight, we're going to do a little bit of a different format. Uh, I know you're accustomed to uh, a certain way that we do things. Um, but because of the way some events have taken place recently, uh, we really felt led, um, led by the Spirit, to do a few things uh, differently today. Right. Uh, one of the things is, is we're, we're not going to do the commercials tonight. We're going to kind of forego the commercials and the announcements. It's a special Two Bros and a Joe. It is a special Two Bros and a Joe. Uh, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's the best way to put it. It's a special Two Bros and a Joe. Um, tonight what we want to do is we want to take, take a minute to uh, not necessarily give a shout out, but uh, more than anything else, uh, offer our support. Offer our support to uh, Congregation uh, Etz Hain, Tree of Life in Pittsburgh. Um, they recently suffered a, a tremendous tragedy. Uh, it's been all over the news. Uh, the loss of uh, 11 lives. And so um, because of that, we want to do a special memorial, kind of a two bros and a Joe memorial. And, uh, and really also make a stand and say we stand with you. Absolutely. We stand with you. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, you'll find this little memorial that, that, that we're about to do uh, uh, tasteful and respectful. Um, we, uh, we speak directly to you, congregation, uh, uh, it's time. Uh, we love you. We are here for you. Uh, our prayers, our hearts, uh, our thoughts, our memories uh, go out to you, your families that have suffered a, a tremendous loss. Um, and uh, we are with you in... in uh, walking stand, uh, side by side with you. Absolutely. Um, our prayer is that you're comforted in this time of grief and that uh, not just you but your families and that somehow, some way, that God would be glorified even in a tragedy like this. And, and uh, finally, uh, may the memory of, of the 11 uh, be blessed. Right. So we, uh, first thing we're going to do, I, I, I'd like to light these candles. Um, wonderful thing about a candle is that, that, that there's a lot of symbolism uh, in fire, in light, uh, that we have here. Um, and so we want to light these candles that, that they represent that, that we, uh, we stand with the light. Uh, we stand in the light. You know, the Messiah is the light. Uh, he is the light of the world. Um, but just as there is light, we understand that there is darkness as well. Right. And we understand as, as pastors and teachers, as, as congregations, uh, what our response, one of our biggest responsibilities is, is that when something of this magnitude of darkness happens, that we respond properly. Absolutely. With light and love. And it's hard. It's very, very hard. And I think, George, it's, it's, it's hard to make sense of all of this. As teachers and, and, and pastors and congregational leaders, I think people look to us to try to make sense of something of this, of, of like this. They, you know, they want to know the whys and, and where it comes from and, and what's, what's going on in people's minds and, and, and how do we get through this tragedy. You know, we get through this tragedy by, by first and foremost remembering whom we all serve. You know, we serve the creator of the universe. We serve Hashem. We serve that. We serve the Father. And, uh, and He comforts us. His Spirit comforts us. We don't answer darkness with darkness. Uh, we answer darkness with light. We love more. We forgive more. We continue on with our, with our lives, living in peace, striving for peace. George, you had something to say. I was just going to say, we come together. Amen. As opposed to separating and as opposed to coming apart. We come together and we let, we let the, the enemy know that you can't conquer us. We will come together. Amen. You know, there's um, just by the very nature of religion, the very nature of congregations and denominations, uh, different schools of thought, there's, there's a, a component of divisiveness, isn't there, that, that, that exists naturally, a, a, a difference of opinion. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's sad that, that, that there are those of us who will allow 
the, the base part of our human nature to take over. Right. And, and allow the differences and the differences of opinions to, to, to really just overwhelm us and, and allow for this type of, for this type of just behavior or behavior, just nonsense. Nonsense, this, right. This nonsense. right. And, uh, you know, there, there's no room for that. There's no room for that. There's no room for that in, in, in what we do. I know, I know there are a lot of, you can look at any one of our videos and, and we're, we're always very happy and, and joyful and, we, and uh, we're always teasing, but this is probably the, one of the most serious videos that we're gonna do uh, because there's just, quite honestly, of course, we're gonna have difference of opinion, but we need to keep dialogue open. Absolutely. We need to continue to talk. We need to continue to, even if we disagree, that we need to continue to encourage one another and stand by one another, especially when something like, like this happens that is just obviously wrong for the entire kingdom. The entire kingdom. There's no room for that. And so, um, you know, as, uh, like I said, as a, as a, as a small memorial, um, we light these candles. We light these candles uh, for the memory of, your, uh, of, your, of the ones that you lost. Uh, and we light these candles to say that, that we are with you. And, and no matter what darkness comes uh, upon you, uh, we will do our best to be the light. To, to be as Mashiach has asked us to be, and that's to be a light yeah, unto the world. <clears throat> <laughs> and you know, uh, there's a lot of times we we, uh, we talk about uh, many uh, Jewish traditions. One of the Jewish traditions, a beautiful tradition, uh, is to read a, a special prayer uh, called the Mourner's Prayer. Uh, it's actually called the uh, the Mourner's Kaddish, okay? Um, I'd actually like to read that to you. Um, I don't know it in Hebrew, but I'm going to read it to you, okay? Uh, it's called the Mourner's Kaddish. And this prayer is prayed uh, all year long for those who have, for those, uh, actually it's unto the Father, uh, when someone passes. It says, glorified and sanctified be God's great name throughout the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and during your days and within the life of the entire house of Yisrael, speedily and soon, and say, Amen. May his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, adored and lauded be the name of the Holy One, blessed be He. Beyond all the blessings and hymns, praises, and consolations that are ever spoken in the world, and say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for all Yisrael, and say, Amen. He who creates peace in His celestial heights, may He create peace for us and for all Yisrael and say, Amen. Amen. You know, um, it's interesting, it's an interesting little fact that um, they pray this prayer <clears throat> to mourn. Um, and if you'll notice, there's actually no mention of the dead in the prayer. It is all praise to God, isn't it? Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And there's actually a little lesson that we can take from this, from performing this uh, traditional prayer. We're reminded in great tragedy that, that even in the midst of great tragedy, if our minds are on the Father and our hearts are on the Father, we will prevail. We will prevail. So congregation, it's Chaim, Tree of Life. Um, our minds, our hearts are with you, and they're on the Father. We mourn with you for the loss of your family members, the loss of your congregants. May their memories be blessed. Amen. 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 So I'd like to, uh, 
Now I'd like to transition actually into the chapter. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Now, before we get into this chapter, and it, and it was, George and I had actually spoken about this chapter because this is an incredibly difficult chapter. We do the chapter, or we do, the, we do this gospel, chapter by chapter, line item by line item, precept by precept. We're in chapter 23. And I was, I was sharing my heart with, with Tony and, and George, and I was, I was telling them, I was like, you know, this is going to be hard to transition into this uh, from this moment of seriousness and this moment of standing with, uh, with uh, Congregation Tree of Life into ch uh, uh, Matthew chapter 23. Because Mashiach uh, begins the chapter, and it is the woes. Woe unto you Pharisees, woe unto you scribes. And, um, there's, and there's some serious dialogue here. There's some very serious dialogue in, in this chapter. And it almost doesn't fit. Okay? And then you get to the end of the chapter, and, and uh, I don't want to ruin the end of the chapter. I'm not a big fan of spoilers. Uh, you get to the end of the chapter. <laughs> he is. I'm not. He, he is. I don't we're like spoilers. We're going to repent about lying after the time. <laughs> 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 I've never ruined it. Yet. I'm a single movie for you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I will now. I promise you that. So at the end of the chapter, Messiah brings it all together. Okay? And uh, with the, his last statement in chapter 23. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to take this chapter. We're just going gonna to read through it. And uh, I, I want you to be prepared, obviously. It's because uh, there's going to be some, some tough language for the Pharisees and the, and the, and the scribes. So just, uh, just a little bit of a backdrop. Um, Messiah ends talking in... I mean, when we finished Matthew chapter 22, we finished up to where he was getting ready to start talking. He was getting ready to transition into this conversation. Amen. With a series of the current events that took place, we, can't, we, can't, we couldn't help but start up where we left off. And so that's also part of it, is that we have no control over what, what else has happened. So we're picking right back up where we left off. We, we wanted to... We wanted to maintain that stream and that line of continuity um, to keep going and to keep pressing on and to keep pressing through. I do believe that that uh, at the end of this, it's all going to come together, like Dacho said, and and God's name is still going to be glorified. So Amen. it will be good. It Amen. will be good. So hang in, hang on to the end. Amen. Shall I pray? You read. How about I pray this time and you read? Okay. I just finished reading, but okay. <laughs> Do you want, okay, I'll read. No, no, that's no, fine. No, you no, sure? Yeah, yeah, I'll read. Okay. Do you want me to pray? Uh, sure. Okay. How about, Father, tonight we come before you and we thank you, Father, for, for everything that you are. Father God, we thank you that you are in control. The Lord, we say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, Lord. And, and I, I just have to say that prayer in that, in that fashion because you are blessed and you are the King of the universe, Lord. You are absolutely 100% in control. And even if my small mind cannot understand the events of history, the things that are going on, Heavenly Father. My comfort is in you, Lord. Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, for Congregation Etz Hain, for Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, Lord. And I ask you, Lord, that you would bring comfort, that you would bring healing, Father God. Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are suffering right now, Father God, who are going through their own personal suffering, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would raise them up, that you would encourage them, Heavenly Father, because you are great, Lord. You are great and mighty. And your name is to be praised for, through all eternity, Lord. You are great and your name is great, Lord. And tonight we focus on you. We focus on you. Even in the midst of our problems, our sorrows, our loss, yes. our mourning, Lord. We focus on you. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. So... If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chairs in the chair of Moses. 
Therefore, do whatever they tell you to do and observe it. But do not do what they do. Because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are, that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Now, do you mind if, I, if we do something a little bit different? I know we're doing it a little bit different. And I usually do it in this format whenever, whenever we do, I do Shabbat Scripture study. We'll, we'll read a portion and then I'll tell you to pause. Okay. Instead of reading the whole thing. And I kind of want to do it with this because there's some really important spots I want to highlight. One of the spots I want to highlight is this first section. Because if we read that verse, those verses again, okay, look carefully at what it's saying in your English translation. Okay? Now, when, uh, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat, in Moses' seat. Now, what is Moses' seat? I would say as judge. Okay, so it's an authoritative position, if you will, right? Now there was a leader's position. A right? leader's position. So what uh, what Messiah was saying is now there was actually a seat in the synagogue. I don't know if you know this or not. In synagogues, there was a seat yes. called Moses' seat, and it was where the the, the lead rabbi or the lead uh, Pharisee would sit, and he would. Obviously, give judgments and rulings and, and uh, things of that nature, and he would uh, he would explain halacha, okay, and uh, he would say that th these are these are how we are going to walk these things out, and it was called the seat of Moshe, okay, or Moses' seat. Now, um, the reason they called it Moses' seat because that was the position of authority. Obviously, Moses was viewed as the ultimate authority in the Torah, and so that's why they called it Moses' seat, okay. So, what Messiah is saying here, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, in verse 3, read verse 3 again for me. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but do not do what they do. Now, interestingly enough, if you were to, add, to read that verse, okay? Because they don't practice what they teach. Okay, well, hold on. All right. <laughs> if you were just to read that verse at face value, right? What is Messiah telling all of us? Read the, read the words again. Don't, don't try to interpret it yet. He's Just saying, read it straight do, what, forward. do what they tell you and observe it. Do what they tell you and observe it. Now, that's a very interesting statement, Pastor George, because if we were to take that thing, and, that, and that's, a, that's a real serious, at, in the New Testament, subject we have to deal with because with the at the time of the Pharisees, these are, if you will, the ancient rabbis, right? right. And so all the rabbinical texts, the Talmud, uh, all of the rabbinical texts, would then we would... We would in all technicality, based on what Mashiach is saying here, what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, whatever these people tell you to do, observe it, to do it. So we have a, we have an issue here, don't we? God yes, because he's, thank you. God he's bless. saying, do what they tell you to do, pay attention to it, observe it. Okay, now, but let's go on, let's go on to the point that you were going to make, okay? Um, he says, uh, thank you. Therefore, whatever they tell you to, to observe, that observe, and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Okay? So in other words, do as they say, not as they do. Right. But now we run it now, now uh, those of us who are, are Bible-believing Christians, we have got a, we've got a serious problem here because that is a whole other set of written works that now it would appear that Messiah is giving authoritative value to, isn't it? Almost like Jesus is saying, go ahead and listen to what the rabbis are saying, right? Now, but he also says, don't do as they do, okay? So what Messiah was saying here at the, at the time, at the, at the moment, that these particular rabbis and these scribes here, okay? There was a heart condition going on, okay? It was obvious that Messiah had a very real problem with how these, how these men were administering the Torah, okay? Now... I'm going to be honest with you. Let me, let, me, let me pause right here. I do not believe for my spiritual halakha, for my walk, okay, as a, even as a messianic believer, okay, I, I've said this before, I do not believe that the rabbinic, the rabbinic writings are spiritually authoritative for my walk, okay? I know several messianic believers believe that, and that's, and that's okay. Again, we're talking about differences of opinion, differences in denominational, denominational belief, but that's okay. We can keep the dialogue going, 
Okay. Now, certainly, we got we got to we got to put the Christians in here somewhere, don't we? And they're certainly not going to go in like, well, well that's that's a, that's a little weird. We haven't been following the rabbis for all these years. Now, all of a sudden, here comes Thatcher on on YouTube saying we might want to have to consider following the rabbis. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. So take a deep breath. Don't 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 run out and get your copies of the Talmud just yet. All right. <laughs> so, um, but it's obvious here that Messiah is saying he he's saying something here according to this text. Do what they say but don't do what they do. Right. And the reason behind that, verse 4, if you don't mind reading. No, not at all. It says, They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on, on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Okay, now heavy loads. Heavy loads is like is, is this burden or this yoke, if you will. Okay, we've talked about that before in the past, where uh, if you... If you understood a lot of the, the the tradition the traditional language there these burdens and these yokes were actually the 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 teachings that are laid upon the shoulders of the believer so what the rabbi what the what the pharisees and the uh, and the scribes were doing at this time they were coming up with these extra yokes or burdens that they would lay on the people but they would not do themselves this is messiah saying this mashiach is saying this unto the people whom he loves i have to say it like that okay so he's saying this he's he's correcting them He's saying these 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 leaders these uh, these people who are in charge of basically the entire religious system are are having this whole extra writings and they're putting them on the shoulders of the people. Remember, Mashiach is here for the people. Christ is here for the people. Okay, and there is a very a very serious contention between Messiah and the current religious system that is set up. So he confronts the religious system. He confronts the hypocrisy, okay? Now, it should not surprise anybody, anybody to know this, that as we continue on and as we develop biblical scholarship, as we develop, as biblical archaeology continues to develop, we learn more and more and more, okay? Now, it, it would be interesting for, uh, for people to find out that this verse in verse, uh, I believe it's 2, no, no, it's verse 3. Verse 3 uh, is translated differently in some, in, uh, in some earlier manuscripts. Okay? And what, in some of the manuscripts it says, Therefore, whatever he tells you to observe, that observe, and do not do according to their works. Referring to Moses. Referring to Moses. Exactly. So that changes the feel of the verse, doesn't it? That's who the he is. Precisely. Okay, so now all the Christians are just like, like, oh, so, let a deep breath on that one. So instead of imposing all the additional rules or laws, he's saying, go back to the basics. Go back to the Torah. Exactly. Right. Now, I will tell you this, Christians, uh, as a messianic believer, as a, as a, as a, uh, a follower of Hebrew roots, I am a believer that, that, uh, that believes that we should follow the Torah. I believe there's a tremendous amount of blessing there. I believe that there's uh, that there is there is so much good there when we do what the Word of God says. It is not a burden. Even in the Book of John, it says the the law is not a burden. I, I know I've heard it's pastors. Freedom. Yeah, exactly. There's it's freedom. I've heard unfortunately well-intended meaning Bible teachers and pastors say that it is a burden. Unfortunately. John, in his epistle, doesn't agree with them. He says it is not a burden, so we should really keep that in mind. And so here, if you, if you, if you take more recent, uh, more recent biblical scholarship, and, and again, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to see it because you're, you're looking at it in, in, well, in red and white. You're looking at it in red and white as what Messiah is saying, and it looks like he's saying, follow the Pharisees and the, and the, and the scribes, just don't do what they do. So you're like, uh, how do I do this? And so it kind of leaves right. us there. But when you find this out, and even what's interesting is the second, is that fourth verse actually adds credibility to that translation. If you look at it properly, if you look at it in its context, therefore, whatever he tells you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of the uh, move them with one of their fingers. Okay, but all their works they do to be seen by men. In other words, he's saying Moses gave you the Torah, 
gave you the straight word of God, they came along and added some extra to it. And with all this extra, we're going to put all this extra on their shoulders and more and more and more till eventually you can't even move. You don't have the freedom to even lift up your hands to praise God and be able to be free in the word when you have all these extra heavy burdens. George, what do you think? Uh, I like I like what you're saying. It makes a lot of sense. Amen. Cool. I'll take that. As, I'll take that as a may, amen. Well, we're gonna pause. Oh, you had some more? No, that's all right. No, no. You were gonna say something. I was gonna say. Well, we're gonna we're gonna pause real quick to take a quick break, and then we're, we're gonna let George continue reading, and we'll get right back into it. Okay. They do everything to be observed by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the, marking, in the marketplaces, and they love to be called rabbi by the people. But as for you, shall I pause you there for just a second? If you'd like to. There's actually, there's actually a lot going on here. So Messiah gets into the heart. Now, if, uh, if, if you're reading certain texts, uh, there's, there's things here that we may not understand that could probably use some explanation, right? Now, in some texts, verse 5, it says, but they... Uh, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries. Well, what is a phylactery? Okay, a phylactery. If you if you've ever looked at, at uh, pictures of, of Orthodox Jews uh, during worship and worship times and celebration, you'll notice that sometimes they have their hands wrapped with what they call tefillin. Okay, and sometimes they'll have it around their. Uh, they'll have uh, one on their forehead. Okay. Well, it's taken from this verse. It's taken from actually in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. So let's all go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. Okay? Now, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. I'll start at verse 6, okay? It's a little extra Bible isn't going to hurt us, right? It says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So the Father wants the Word of God on our hearts and our minds, right? That's very clear from that first verse, okay? One of those first two verses. Now, verse 8 says, And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, if you ever, uh, if you ever see those little mezuzahs, on doorposts, you'll see uh, Orthodox Jews, Messianic Jews, a lot of people from the Jewish community will come by and they'll kiss those as they walk in through the door. It is a, it is a tradition that was developed to, to obe in obedience to that scripture. And that's what those phylacteries are uh, and the, the tefillin are, is, is, to, is to obey that word. Now, this is interesting. It was obviously an operation during Second Temple period, during the time of Messiah. So that you, you, you saw that in full swing. But Messiah is beginning to criticize them at this point. He's saying, he says, you, you're, these, these guys are doing these things to be seen. He's not saying that they were bad, okay? Now remember, it's, it's tradition. But, I, you know, I, I, I've got to say we've all got traditions. And not all traditions are bad. Some of them come from directly from Scripture. A lot of our traditions come from Scripture. You know, but we have to remember, you know, what are the traditions and what is the Word of God, okay? Right. And so... Now, these traditions obviously came from Scripture. They were in full operation during during Second Temple period, during the time of Mashiach, right? And so it's obvious it's here in the, here in the text, and, and they, were, they, were, they were doing it, okay? But it's a tradition. Um, but what he was saying was, he wasn't saying that this, or this tradition was bad. He's just saying that the heart behind it was bad. Well, sometimes that can be us too. Right. We have our traditions, and sometimes... Sometimes our heart is not in the right place over a tradition. I have seen, I have, I have heard of, of, of well-intended believers that get into arguments fussing over tradition. Right. Not, even, not even arguing over the Word of God. George, what do you think? I think that many times we can get lost in tradition. Um, it doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant, Messianic, Jew. It doesn't matter. We can get lost in it to the point to where I've asked people who are believers, why do you why do you do that? And they have no clue or concept 
on why they do it. They just say, well, it's just something we do in our church. It's very important to find out the why we do these traditions and don't lose sight of that because that's the important part. Because once it becomes ritualistic and you don't even know why you're doing it anymore, it no longer matters. For instance, I'll touch on a subject that is pretty popular in every, in every denomination. Fasting. Many times, fasting, uh, people will say, well, I'm fasting for this, or on these particular days, our church always does a corporate fast. Not knocking it. Not knocking it by any means. But if you say, okay, why, are you, why do you do that? And they say, I don't know, we just do it. Well, now you've kind of lost the concept. Now you've kind of lost, why even do it, is, I guess is basically what I'm saying at that point. Because now you're just kind of going through the motions. And you're and there's no there's there's no heart behind it, mm. and from from what we're reading, that seems to anger the Messiah. That seems to anger Christ, because you should never forget why you do what you do. You know, I, I had a conversation uh, with my girlfriend uh, recently, and we were talking about uh, we were talking about a particular holiday, and uh, she was asking me, you know, well, you know, you don't do this, and you do this, you don't do this. Okay, and she's like. Well, where should I stand on this issue, what have you? And and obviously there was some there was some there was some, some open dialogue there, and, and she was kind of going back and forth on, on, on something. And I told her I said I, I said the, the best piece of advice that I can give you is research it, research right. it, look it up, make it your own, make it your own. That that has always helped me when I see something in the scriptures. First and foremost, it's mine now. Right. I'm not. I'm not basing my belief on something that someone else told me. It's, it's out of the Word of God, so it's mine. Right. It becomes my personal conviction. The Holy Spirit is speaking loud and clear to me, I, and and so at that point, it's not an argument of I'm doing it because Pastor so and so said right. or Rabbi right. so and so said. I'm doing it because the Father in His Word has clearly pointed this out. That's the best, and that's the best. No that's one can take that away from you right. at that point. And then, of course, too, you want to get into, you want to start researching history of where things come from. Always research history of where things come from, because even though they may be well-intended, we might be missing the idea. And then, of course, what ends up happening is, is that we hold on to these ideas and we turn them into burdens for other people. Right. You know, and, and again, I mean, the, the, the examples can go on and right. on and on about some, some pretty silly experiences that I know George has had and I know I have had in, in, in congregations and, and with other believers and it's like uh, you're telling yeah. me I can't do this why yeah. <laughs> you know? it's like um, well I'm not really sure I believe that you got a passage to back that yeah. up <laughs> you know help me out here brother you know? and sometimes you get the answer because that's what we do because that's what we do yeah you like, know hmm. okay uh, uh, respectfully yeah yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what you do I, I'm okay with that I'm okay with that, and then we continue the walk, you know. But again, I, I want to I want to continue to encourage us, um, even though we all have our different tradi- all, all have our different traditions and stuff like that. We are having this particular study, and we are doing this memorial because even our differences, though, should not get us to the point where where we take violence against one another, where right. we where we start hating each other. We just need to recognize that you know what we are different. Tatra and I are best friends, the best of friends. And, and we're very different. But yet, I think our differences are what bring us closer together. And we respect each other's viewpoint. And we, we, can, we can sit there and have a dialogue about something. And both of us prove our points and why we believe what we believe. And, and yet still walk away from that conversation with love and, and, and as friends still. Amen. Because... I don't think that just looking at history, not even looking at scripture at this point, if you look at history, when you try to force what you believe on someone else and make them make it theirs, it's never going to happen. Because there are some people who are naturally resistant. It's a reflex. That's that's basically what it boils down to. If you hit me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flinch and then I'm going to hit back. It's, it's just... A reflex. Sometimes there's no, even, there's not even any thought in front of it, you know. And it's the same thing here. And and I think what what needs to happen is that we need to to embrace the idea that the kingdom needs to win. 
Right. It doesn't, and I love what George says. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant, Messianic Jew, Orthodox Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a rabbi, a pastor, a teacher, a minister. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter if you're a bishop. None of that matters or should matter to the believer. What should matter is the kingdom winning, is the kingdom of God being edified. We can disagree and the kingdom of God would still be edified. As long as, we, as long as we know when to walk away or, or how to walk away from a conversation and still be able to come to each other in a table of fellowship. George and I, have, have, and we were talking about, we're, we've, been, we've been doing, uh, I, I'm, I'm almost reaching 20 years now. I don't know, where do you start counting? You start counting before, the, 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 during the youth years or, or like that two week period before, you, <laughs> before I got saved right. George rededicated his life? Yeah, I, would, I would count that because okay. it's, it's been a, a continuous one. Okay, so we're almost, next year will be 20 years for us, which wow, is really, really cool. Right. I was thinking about that. And within those 20 years, it's been a lot of exciting stuff going on and happening. And, and you meet people from different denominations and, and, and different walks in their for faith. Sure. And sometimes they're not always good experiences, are they? No. <laughs> no. But what, what, what the Father has shown me is, is that, is that the, the, when we really lose, when we really lose, is when we, we start hating. Right. We start hating because that's still my brother. I remember the Father told me very clearly, you are not allowed to hate that person. Because that's still my daughter or my son. Wow, that's still, still my, daughter. my child. Right? That's still my child. You don't get to. Right. You don't get to. You don't get to be that mean to him. You can have your hurt feelings if you want to. Right. But you better get over your garbage, Sacho, because right. that's, that's still, still my, my child. Yeah, exactly. And and guess what? God still has. God God can still use that person and still uses those people. If I could say it like this, I mean, just kind of spin off of what Sacho was saying. I just my mind went somewhere else. But when we go before God, he's not going to say, Pastor George, mm -hmm. this is what you did. It, that's not going to happen. Rabbi so-and-so, the Bible says he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest or away from me. I knew you not. You see, it's not about a title. It doesn't matter if you're the president of this or if you're the vice president of that or if you're Dr. So-and-so, when it comes to God, we need to get beyond ourselves. And that goes not only with our self-title or our self-righteousness, but it also goes into the way we treat others because that other person, regardless of they hurt, whether or not they hurt you or they wronged you or they cheated you, that is still a child of God. It is still a creation of God. And mark my words. God will still use that person for his honor and <laughs> for his glory. If absolutely for no other reason, absolutely. just to prove me wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. like I will use that person I thought right. just right. to show you that I can still do it. And the truth of the matter is, is, is if someone does, if someone, if you do have bad dialogue with somebody about opposing views of doctrine or, or theology, you know, it, we should be rooting for them. We should be rooting that the Father continues to use them, that the, that, the, that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is moving in their life. Because we, don't, we do not have all the, the, all the answers are not at this table. I promise you that. They are not at this table. I can use a bunch of fancy Hebrew and Greek terms, but I'm just throwing out stuff that I've picked up over the years. Right. That's the truth of it. And, and, and it, it, it doesn't matter where, where, like George says, it doesn't matter the degrees or the or the or, or even even the education. A lot of certificates times, certificates on the wall, right? you know, the certificates on the wall. Where is our hearts? That's because it. that's what Messiah is talking exactly. about. Exactly, he is talking about the condition of our hearts. Exactly, and and, and it's again, and he's calling them out. Exactly, he's like, this is the area that you need to fix. That's what he's doing. This right, this is the area you need to fix. And it's actually the most loving thing that he could possibly do for <laughs> At them. At that time, right. right. They, they are so steeped in their own, like George says, their own self-righteousness. Like, like the word is clearly telling us, we have to be careful. We have to, we, we should walk out our salvation with fear and trembling, step by step. Am I being too, am I being too nessio? Am I being too prideful? I had to throw a nest in there. I don't, I don't know why I threw a nest in there. <laughs> am, I, am I just being too arrogant? It, it, you know, it, do I do I think of myself as 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 the as the perfect Hebrew scholar? Absolutely not. But there are times when my actions, I guarantee you, stuff that comes out of my mouth, it, it doesn't quite line up with where my attitude should be. Right. And so, step by step, I need to be cautious. And these words, 
need to be a warning in my ear because I am just as human and just as susceptible to this type of failure as these men were right here. As these men were right here, I am equally as susceptible Absolutely. to that arrogance. I'm going to go somewhere and, and I mean, uh, I'm not one, how do I say it? The book of Acts says this, it talks about how the leaders in the church were supposed to make uh, an impression on society. And when we come together and we start aligning ourselves up with a political party, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it like that. We go political, huh? I, you know me, I don't do that. So what I'm saying is this, is that believers should be their own party. Mm. Their own party that shakes up the other parties. Because in reality, everybody's got it right to a certain degree and everybody's got it wrong. And and what blows my mind is when, when we as believers align and say this is who I am no we rep we are Christians and we represent God Almighty that's who we represent and that ha should be shaking this nation to its very core by what we believe and and if the book of Acts is correct we should be influencing the not only the church but the country for the kingdom mm. and and we are failing in that area if I could say it like that I, I got to quote a friend of mine. I got to quote. This is not mine. A uh, little shout out to Dorian Saldana. This one's for you, brother. I, I always get some really awesome tidbits from Brother Dorian. One of the things that he said to me a long time ago when we were talking politics and what have you, and, uh, and of course, we were, we were at a kind of a, a, little, a little opposite ends of the spectrum on that, but he said something that made some, some, some major, major sense. He said, our country is not suffering from a problem that the Republicans can fix, or that the Democrats can fix. Right. We do not have a political problem. We have a kingdom problem. Absolutely. This country has a kingdom problem. Okay? Like George says, we are believers. We are Christians. We are believers. The church. We are the, the ecclesia, the body. Yeah. We are the church. We are the called out ones. Right? And so it, he's absolutely right. Whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, whether you're conservative, whether you're liberal, honestly, it doesn't matter. Don't doesn't, use that as a platform to take shots at people. Because we are, we are the body. We are the body. What we are suffering right now is from a kingdom problem. That's and, right. and quite honestly, the Father's going to use any platform that He wants to, 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 to make the things come about. And we, we should be praying for the peace Amen. of our country. Amen. No matter in, in what party it comes from. Now, of course, uh, you're going to vote how you want to vote. And, and may, that's good. And may the vote. Father lead you. Vote. Yeah, absolutely. Go vote. Go vote. Go vote. Go vote. Man, yeah. we, we're getting political yeah. on this thing. That's it. No more. No, I don't like talking about it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so go vote. <laughs> that, that's the point. That's it. Go vote. Uh, let the Father lead you. Go Amen. vote. Amen. <laughs> Did I say go vote? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah. So let's get back into the scriptures. Uh, and let's get in. Let's let's. Well, we let's, need to make up our. We need to make our own party and yeah. shake the nation. Let's call it the Kingdom Party. <laughs> I, I like that. We'll call <laughs> it the Kingdom Party. You know, I'd like to nominate myself as uh, as as a candidate running for the Kingdom Party. Yeah. I, I think I'd be good. So back to they like being called <laughs> Rabbi. Nah, I'm just kidding. Nah. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Send your donations. Yeah. You're not just kidding. Just joking. Just joking, just joking. I'd make a horrible politician. Yeah. My name is Tacho, and I approve this. I approve yeah, this yeah. message. <laughs> Go I, ahead, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> like, can you imagine all these people? Like, who is this yeah, knucklehead this come here? <laughs> what? Free, free banana split Sunday. What are you talking about? No. Oh my goodness, where are we, George? We are on verse, we, we read up to verse 7 where it says, that they, that they uh, let me see, verse 6, they love the place of honor at banquets and the front seat at synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, excuse me, and they love to be called rabbi by people. But as for you, verse 8, do not be called a rabbi because you have one teacher and you are all brothers. Do not Call uh, anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. And do not be called masters either because you have one master, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be, be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself 
will be exalted. I'm going to pause you right there. Okay, so that's a good spot to pause because what he's doing, what Messiah is doing is making this comparison now. He's using the attitude of the Pharisees here at this point, and then he's contrasting it with what he wants from his disciples. Now, there are some, there is, the Messiah is using some rather unusual language here. He's saying, he says, don't call anyone rabbi, don't call anyone father, don't call anyone teacher. And so, so is it, it naturally begs the question, well, are we allowed to call anybody a rabbi? Because, I mean, there's a lot of rabbis out there, right? Even in the Messianic community, there's a lot of rabbis out there. There's a lot of teachers out there. I, I personally, as, as, a, as I guess just as a, as, a, as a matter of speaking, people often ask me, well, what is your ministry? I, I consider myself a teacher, right? Um, and I have no problem with someone calling me a, te a Bible teacher. Um, but now, according to this, if you were to read it just at straight face value, it looks like people shouldn't be calling me teacher, right? Right. But what you have to do is you have to look at look at the context of what it's saying. Now, we all have fathers. If you are in this world and you're watching this video, you got a daddy. Okay? We all have a father, right? <laughs> and so what is, is Messiah saying? That's so funny. I'm sorry. The way you said it. Okay, sorry. Please continue. Okay. So if is Messiah saying that you cannot call your father father? No. He's making an example. Okay? He's making a very specific example about he was he was talking about the heart condition of the leading religious leader, the religious leaders at the time so what he was saying was don't be so caught up with these titles right don't be so caught up with the title of rabbi that that is all that you're that is all that you're after or father because that's all that you're after or teacher because that's all that you're after and you completely forget about the heart of what you're supposed to be doing remember the messiah is after our hearts I think it's also, there's a tendency whenever you have a physical, tangible person to mentor you, to teach you, to, to follow after them. And, and whenever they fail or whenever they fall or whenever something happens, you tend to be so affected by it that you get pulled away and you stop believing in God because you feel like, well, if that person fell... And, and I, I, I don't want to mention any names, but there have been mighty men of God who, who have fallen. And, and I remember seeing news reporters saying, oh, hey, what are you going to do now that so-and-so uh, fell? And you would hear people say, oh, that dude's a fake, and, or that, that person's a fake, and this and that, and they'll, and they'll go on and on. I remember I saw one years ago when I was younger. A, a man had, had fallen from, from grace, as they say. And, and he, he was a preacher, and... Uh, Unfortunately, he fell into sin, and they went to a youth who was a member of his congregation, and they asked the youth, they asked this young man, what are you going to do now that your pastor messed up? And he said, I'm going to keep going because my eyes are on Jesus. You see, that is the right attitude. That's the right heart. You need to have your eyes on the Father. Mm. You don't need anybody else. And there are people who are like, oh, look at me. I belong to so-and-so who's led by pastor or rabbi so-and-so. This is who I belong to. And all of a sudden it becomes a social club and not, it, in other words, the, the, the attention is on this is who I am, this is where I belong, and this is where I go to fellowship and congregate. You belong to the Father. And, and never lose sight of that. We're all one body, whether one is bigger than the other or not. We're all one body, and let's not lose sight of that. What I'm trying to say, I want to say what I'm trying to say, church, because we are the church, is that we're on the same team. We're on the same side. Let's not forget that at the end of the day. And many times what we will do is we will allow our differences to divide us. And in actuality, we should be having our differences to bring us even closer together, if that makes sense. Got springboarding off of that uh, last Sunday's last Sunday's message. If you get a chance, uh, listen to the message. And what I'd like you to do is I would like you to follow up follow it up with the song that George had him play at the end of the message. I'm not really sure if I not that I don't watch the message, but <laughs> I don't know if that song was 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 followed up with the message and the recording of the message. But um, I think it was. I don't think it was. Think it was. Okay, so if you get a chance. Uh, and you're gonna have to. You're probably gonna have to remember the song. You probably remember the title, and it's by Casting Crowns. And I remember when I first heard that song, uh, it really ministered to me uh, because the song itself talks about how uh, the 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 singer was saying, "I don't want to be remembered. Oh, yeah. I want 
the name of Christ to be remembered. That he was, he was, he was, he was, uh, he's, he's only Jesus. Only Jesus. He's like casting crowns. Only Jesus. Okay, yeah. When you get a chance, listen to that song. Uh, because, and, and, and hand in hand with that message, because we do have a tendency, it's human nature to want the spotlight. You actually have to work hard and not wanting the spotlight, the majority of us. It's easy to, 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 to fall into, into that. that, into that, man, I like this, and no, it, it's always got to be about him. Exactly. If, if nobody, and, and, I, and I, when I heard that song, it really made me stop and, and think. Absolutely. That is, that is the attitude I need to have. I need to remember <laughs> to hold on to that attitude because this isn't my life. This isn't George's life. This isn't even, honestly, this isn't even our show. This is not the George and Thatcher show. This is not the George, Tony and Thatcher show. This show, this these episodes, they if they don't bring honor and glory to the Messiah, if they don't bring honor and glory to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, we, we need to pack it up and go home. I agree. We need to pack it up and go, we're doing the wrong thing. We just need to stop. We need to stop teaching. We need to pack it up and go home. Because that's our goal. Amen. Our goal is that you will one day forget us completely, but you will always, you will always hold on to Messiah. That's right. You will always take Jesus with both hands, and you will hold him closely, and him you will never forget. Amen. And so, uh, yeah, love. We want his name to be glorified. Amen. Lift it up high, and I, and I, and I think that's that's, right. that's uh, that that really needs to be said, it, and it should be for all of us, all the denominations that are out there. You know, those of you who are listening, if, you, if you're listening, you're Catholic or or, or or Protestant, go through the whole list of denominations. Right. It doesn't it doesn't matter it, as long as the Messiah is glorified. We're we're gonna meet at the end. I've I've met people who are like, oh. I'll, I've done this and I've achieved that and look at my accolades and look it's like you need to stop that you're, you're you're treading on very dangerous ground because if you listen closely that whole I I I me 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 you're glorifying yourself and the, and and it's very it's very evident and so you really at the end of the day have you glorified the name of the Messiah have you glorified the name of Christ. Have you lifted him up today? That's right. Did you lift him up more than you lifted yourself up? How about that? That's a challenge. Mm. All these challenges going out. Right, right. For all those, for all those of you who like challenges, <laughs> I got a challenge for you. Can you lift up the name of Christ before you lift up yourself? There's a challenge. Okay, uh, we're getting the signal. We got like a minute, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna take another break. We're gonna get some fresh coffee, more a couple of cups of Joe, and we'll be right back with you. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Oh, now we're starting. Okay, so now we're starting. Okay, so now it's going to go ahead and continue on. Uh, we're starting again on verse 13, Matthew 23, verse 13. George is going to read, and let me just kind of make do a little intro here. From this point forward, Messiah is going to do a bunch of woes, if you will, right? I've got to say it like that because that's, that's how it is in the text. Woe you, woe you, woe you. He starts handing out woes like Skittles. Right? To the Pharisees and the scribes. Like Oprah. <laughs> like like Oprah. Here, you get a woe. You get a woe. You get a woe. Right? <laughs> Didn't he say he's not a spoiler? Yeah. It, you have that, right? I mean, you, you, we, I can rewind you just spoil the woes. Like Damien says. Dude, everybody knows they're the woes. <laughs> like, how is that spoiling? I'm not getting to the good stuff right, yet, right? right? So, so I'm going to try. Stop me, stop me whenever you feel. I'm going to try not to stop you because we want to try and get through these woes so we can get to this last portion of it, okay? But go ahead and go, go. I'll try to stop you. Yes, sir. But woe to, the, to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people. You don't, you don't go in, for you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You devour widows' houses and make long prayers just for show. This is why you will receive a harsher punishment. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to make one a proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you were. Mm. Woe to you, you blind guides who say, whoever takes an oath by the sanctuary, it means nothing. But whoever takes an oath... By gold, by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by this old, by, by this oath. Blind fools, which are which which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary that sanctified the gold. Also, 
Whatever ta wh whoever takes an oath by the altar, it means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gift that is that is on it is bound by that oath. Blind people, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sacrifices the gift? Therefore, the one who takes an oath by the altar takes an oath by it and everything on it. The one who takes an oath by the sanctuary takes an oath by it and it and and by him who dwells in it. In other words, referring to God. Uh, and the one who takes an oath by heaven takes an oath by God's throne and him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay the tenth of the mint, dill, and cumin. Yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Things should... Things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, yet you gulp down a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and selfish indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, so that the outside of it may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside they are, they are full of dead men's bones and every impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the, the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have taken part with them in shedding the prophet's blood. You therefore testify against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's sins. Snakes, brood of vipers, how can you escape being condemned to hell? This is why I'm sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and you will crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and, and hound them from town to town. So all the righteous bloodshed on the earth will be charged to you, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of, of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. I assure you, all these things will come on this generation." Okay, let's go ahead and pause right there. Uh, now, something of, of major, major importance, I, I have to say, before we even get into this, okay? If, you, if you've if you listened to what George was reading, the language is strong. It's very intense. Very intense language that the Messiah is using for the scribes and the Pharisees here. Um, the problem comes when we take this language and we use it as a justification for an attitude against people who are not even there. Okay? I, I, have, I have had the displeasure of having conversations with people uh, who, quite honestly, are, are, take an anti-Semitic stance because, because they feel they're justified by passages in the scriptures and, and things like this that are being said, that the Messiah is, is clearly, in, and I can't, I'm not disagreeing that the Messiah is not speaking very strongly to the Pharisees, very strongly to the scribes. He's saying, whoa, he's even talking about a condemnation to hell. That is there in the text. That is very clear. But he is not condemning a whole people. He is not condemning a whole race. He is not ejecting the Jews from salvation. That is an incorrect perspective to take. And he is not giving us license in any way, shape, or form to take action in physical violence against a people. So I have to start off what I'm going to say by saying that first. We, if, if you have a difference of opinion, of course you're allowed to have a difference of opinion with somebody from a different denomination. But, that, but the Messiah is not giving you a right to take up arms. If you listen closely to who he's addressing, he's addressing hypocrites, yes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but he ends it with hypocrites. He's 
And then he tells them how they're being hypocrites. He's saying you're doing it as a show. In other words, it's not here. You're doing it out here. You know, one of the things that hit me as I was reading it right now was when he says, you're like whitewashed tombs. Well, whitewashed tombs are for dead people. And he says, on the outside, you look very pretty. It's a show. But on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. He's basically saying, on the inside, you're dead. You know, we, we, we have a term in church, in, in, in Christendom, in, in church vernacular, revival. We talk about revival. Well, that's what he's referring to, is that these people are dead on the inside. To the point to where he's saying, like basically, he's calling them fakers. And so we need to be real careful when we, when we want to pass a certain judgment and feel that we are right. In, our, in what we're going to say. How dare we? How dare we do that? Because in reality, we need to be very careful on how we treat God's people. Because what I'm learning is that, is that everybody's got it flawed somewhere. I mean, all you, let, me, let, me, let me be this transparent. All you got to do is look at Facebook. And you'll see somebody putting something on there like, oh, God bless you. And, 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 and God's mercies are renewed every morning. And then the very next thing, they're condemning or they're judging someone else. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't glorify God. And in the, same, in the very same breath or in the very next text, send out something that's vulgar or something that's nasty against, against a certain group of people. Because you're not demonstrating the love of God. If I could say it like that. That's pretty transparent. <laughs> I would have to say, like, hmm, that is very transparent. Because, because what now you're no different than the way these guys were behaving. Absolutely. Sass. Absolutely. Sass. And, and, and we do have to stand up. We do. We do obviously stand for uh, stand against sin. Okay. We do stand against right. sin, and we do we do call it out, especially within ourselves. You know, we we, we look for the, we look for the sin uh, always within ourselves, and um, but. It, 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 is, uh, it is very commonplace, especially, I mean, now in social media, and of course, you're watching this on social media. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <by the> way, <laughs> watching it on media. So cast your vote. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's, it's ironic. It's ironic because uh, it, it gives everybody a voice. You know, it gives everybody a platform. And so uh, you will see people give their, their personal views on, on every subject, you know, their family, their children, politics, and religion, and... and and so forth, and uh, you, you 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 get to start to know people's people's thoughts. You you read their thoughts. You read their, and you can you can see where where their hearts are at. Uh, now, obviously, now that's not the totality of everything that they're they're thinking or what have you. That's their mood. Their current mood. Their current mood at the time. Uh, but Scripture teaches us very clearly. Messiah says, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak." You know, and so now we've got this little. This little uh, ability to put this information out, where uh, our heart is pouring out into this, and uh, like George said, it's ca caution, caution, believer, what you put on social media. I, I thank the Father above that when George and I were young, <laughs> social media was not around, so you could record the 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 ignorant stuff that we would do. Hallelujah! Oh hey, Lord, you and I were just talking about that. Me, you, and, and your wife were just talking about that this weekend. Like, how much trouble would we have been if social media was around when we were young, you know? A lot of trouble. Yeah. You, you think about that, the young, the young generation today, that's what they have to contend with. Right. Because a lot of that's coming back to bite them in the tush. That's it, whenever they're going out to get a, a job or whatever. But we do have to re show restraint. We really do because, you know, it was told to me like this many, many years ago. I need to be careful when I point a finger at somebody because three of them are pointing back at me. And I've got to remember that all the time. You know, he, uh, that's, that's right now. That's why you point like this. <laughs> like this, mm -hmm. right? No, so. Uh, <laughs> the Middle Eastern way. Mm. So that's when I were talking the other day and we were talking, I forget how the conversation came up or where it was going, but, but we were talking about how we're trying to be careful when we talk to, to people because we never want to misrepresent God and we always want to point them to God. We're, we're, I know what it was, now I remember. We're talking about we want to do something special um, for for the congregation here in the church, and we want to we we want to record them and 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 have them share their heart. But we want to be real careful not not to not to glorify man or not to glorify a church building, but to glorify God in it. 
And so it's funny because we're saying, oh, you know, we're shooting out ideas. But at the end of it all, we were saying, okay, but how does that glorify God? And I think that that's, that's an awesome system of checks and balances is that we should always, we should have someone. If I could say it like that, we should have someone or even have some people that we can be accountable to. Somebody that we can share our hearts. Amen. This is how I feel. This is how I feel right now in this moment. And it might not be the best feeling, but it's an emotion. But I need somebody to remind me. It's just a feeling. In 10 or 15 minutes, that sucker may pass, right? Mm -hmm. That's one, one thing. I need to have someone that I can be real, that I can be honest, that I can be open with, that I can be transparent. Not just me, but you and everyone else who's watching. We need to have someone who can do that. But also, we also need to be able to grow from that and say, you know what? This is how I felt but let me grow from this. Don't stay stuck there in that, in that mire, if you will, in that miry clay. You, you need to be able to, to move from that. I like what George says because we're, we're looking to grow. Uh, and, and, and I try to point this out every time, every time that subject comes up because you definitely don't want to stay at what we consider the baby Christian stage right. of life. Or stagnant. You know? Right, right. It, exactly. I, it, it's my heart's desire that the believer would grow to where everything, every area and every avenue of their life is about God. Right. You know, I mean, because because there, there's a lot of us as believers, we struggle with some very, some, some, some very simple things, things that we watch, things that how we talk, our attitude. Uh, I'm going to get a little real here with, with the music we listen to. You know, the movies we watch, you know. I know you hear these things in church and you may not think that they have an effect on you. But, you know, you got to ask yourself every once in a while, if Messiah was sitting right beside you where you could physically reach out and touch his hand and hold his hand in a movie theater, would you be watching the same movie that you're watching? Would you change the channel if he rang your doorbell? Right. He's exactly. like, hey, can I come in and hang out with you guys for a while? Or if you gave him a ride in your car, would you change the station? And then those are things. Those are things that that you really need to take into consideration and say, hey, you know what? I need to grow from this. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying that maybe there's some there's some areas that where we need to grow. We need to change some things. We need to look like believers. I know a lot of people. A, a, a lot of believers were were worried about looking like the world. Like we're worried. We're worried about looking like the world, dressing like the world, talking like the world, fitting we, in. Fitting in. You're not supposed to fit in. The truth of the matter is that this world is is not going to make it to the end. The philosophies, the ideas, that that's going to change. The Messiah is going to get rid of all that. And so you have to remember, like, okay, well, what brings death versus what brings life? That's right. And so we 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 need to ask ourselves when when we when we are there and our works are before the Father, are they going to be like stubble and hay? Or will they be refined? You know, and so I, I, I encourage you, search your own heart. Because in, in all of these woes, if you look at everything that Messiah is saying, he's offering correction for different things that they were doing. He's offering correction. And, and, and we need to do that as brothers and sisters. As George says, we need to be accountable to one another. Look for that brother or sister that you can be accountable to. If you read it, right, if you just read it, you'll see, like Thatcher says, he does offer correction. And in some of them, he offered, he actually offers judgment. He's like, you need to fix this? You need to fix that? That's about to send you to hell. You, you know, and he's, he's, he's showing them, he's showing them that mirror once again. Mm -hmm. This is what's in your heart. This is what you're saying, and this is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. This is what you're telling other people to do, but yet you're not leading by example. All you're doing is 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 uh, lip service, but your heart is far from me. That's what he's saying, and we we have to capture that. Right. We really have to capture that. And the ancient sages, and I, and I have to point this out because you know, there, who knows? Maybe there maybe there is an unbelieving or a, 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 a an Orthodox Jew that's not listening or that that's listening that may not believe that Yeshua is Messiah. And I understand that, and, and some of these texts may be a little bit difficult to hear. But remember this, the ancient sages and rabbis taught that when Mashiach comes, he is going to bring correction. He's going to tell us how we are supposed to walk. And that's what he's doing. Right. He's doing that. He's doing, now, he's doing it in a very stern manner. And we cannot be dishonest and look at the Tanakh, look at the Old Testament, and say that the Father did not offer correction to his people. 
There is all over the Old Testament, we are being correct. And I say we as believers, we're all being corrected left and right. The Father is in the business of correcting his people on this side of eternity. Because when we step into the other side of eternity, we need to be corrected. Amen. You got to think about how much he loves people to, to actually take this type, this bold of a position. And, and we're going to get right into that. With that, that being said, let's read this last portion of chapter with that in mind. Okay. I want you to keep that in mind. How much the Father, how much the Mashiach and the Spirit loves us with this last portion. George, would you mind reading the no, last portion? If I could just say this before I read it is... Please be careful also on how, you know, at the very beginning of the woes, he, he talked about, woe to you who, who lock up heaven. We need to be very careful when we, dis, when we try to decide or choose who we're going to share him with. Mm -hmm. We should share him with everyone. Amen. Even when we're afraid, even when, when we feel embarrassed, even when we feel ashamed. Because those are feelings that, that kind of pass through every believer at some point or another. When we're dealing with our own sin, our own faults and frailties and our own mistakes, the, the, the responsibility, the right. duty, there's right. a duty, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a prayer uh, in the Jewish community that it is a duty. It is a duty. We have a duty to represent the Father on this earth. We have a duty to represent Messiah. On this earth, we are the light. Let, let, let's handle each other with care and and with love, and be very careful whether we're we're whether we're believers of the same of the same belief system or whether we're not. Let's always approach each other in love. Amen. Now, re, again, on that on that thought, I want I want George to read this last portion. It says, "Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her." How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing. See, your house is left to you docile. For I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, I don't want to, I want to leave that text just the way it is. But what I want to do is I want to introduce you to the emotion behind that text. Okay? Don't just read the text at face value and, and think that Messiah is just ending this really eloquent uh, butt chewing, if you will, for the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, and he's just ending it right here. Messiah is grieving and lamenting over his people because they won't. They, they won't come to him. They won't repent. He's, he's in pain. Okay? So I want you to understand this from God's perspective. I want you to understand, and George was talking about that earlier. We were off camera. And we were talking about trying to understand something from God's perspective. The, the uh, Last week's Shabbat lesson, okay, uh, we were focused on, uh, I believe it was 4 and 5, Exodus 4 and 5, Shemot 4 and 5. And there was, there's, a, there's a passage in there where the Father says this very clear message. Israel is my firstborn, my son, okay? I want you to understand that, that God's position is the position of a father. <laughs> now, I'm not a father, but George is a father, and Tony is a father. And when they see their little ones mi being mishandled, when they see their little ones under the attack of the enemy, when they see their little ones going astray, there is this special feeling that they get in them. And they become a, a defender. They become a warrior. There's this, there's this righteous anger that comes right. over them to defend their child. And it's the same, it's the same passion that Messiah is expressing here. Like a mother hen, I have desired to put my wings over my chicks and bring them in. Bring them close. Do not miss. Do not miss what the Father is saying here. Right. Do not miss what the Messiah is saying here. Yes, it looks, Matthew 23 looks really harsh. But because the, the, the Messiah is like, I'm so frustrated because I love you so much. Because I love you, I want you to stop this behavior. Right. I want you to stop this behavior. And, and, and I can just imagine that the tears are rolling down his face. 
as he is saying this last part. It, we, we, te we have a tendency to look, and, and that's what we were talking about, a tendency to look at Scripture from a humanistic point of view because we are human. It's just natural. Mm -hmm. And we very rarely ever take the time to look at it from God's perspective. <clears throat> And and we really need to we really need to to pause for a second and say you know what what drove Jesus to be this brutally honest and so if I could paint the picture for you like this have you ever loved somebody enough to be brutally honest with them have you ever loved somebody enough that you, if you were to see them burning in a building would you go in there and grab them by the hair and drag them out if it was to save their life. Even if they were scratching and they were pawing at you to let them go because of the pain that they were in, would you still drag them out even by the hair to save their life? And that's how I picture Jesus in this text right here, Matthew chapter 23. It's almost as if he's thrown life preserver after life preserver after life preserver after life preserver for 22 chapters. And in this chapter, it's a moment of desperation where he starts swinging an oar. Even if I've got to knock you out and drag you in, I'm going to do what I have to do to save you because I love you. It would be equivalent to me restraining my child physically to keep them from running out into the street and getting run over. It would be equivalent to me jumping in a pool, grabbing my drowning child and throwing them out even if they got hurt as I threw them out. It was, it was to save the life of that individual. Or us. Amen. As we close Matthew chapter 23, um, I want us to focus on the heart of Messiah. We have very few minutes left over. Um, I don't want Matthew chapter 23 to be remembered as the woes, the the harshness of the text. I want Matthew chapter uh, 23 to be remembered by because of the heart of the Messiah. When we when we fight as brothers and sisters, when we when we fight a, a congregation versus congregation or church versus synagogue or whatever denomination against whatever denomination, we might be thinking that we're honoring the Messiah, but we're not. We honor God by loving one another. Right. Even in our differences. Now, I'm not saying that loving one another means that you have to accept every behavior. Or even agree. Or even agree with every behavior. Amen. Amen. But we certainly need to respect one another. And we need to respect each other's life. Especially the right to life. And so, as we, uh, as we end Matthew chapter 23, we end our, our memorial. I guess our shout out would be to every denomination out there. Everybody that calls himself a believer. Believer in Hashem, believer in Mashiach, however your denomination is, Christian, Jew, Protestant, Catholic, whoever you are. We love you. We pray for you. And more than that, God loves you. And and it's our hope and prayer that, that we would all one day uh, we would all one day maintain this respect for life and not look to snuff each other's light out in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. George, would you uh, lead us out in prayer? Absolutely. If, if you're an unbeliever and you're watching, I want you to know that the God that you don't believe in loves you. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray to be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord. Father, I thank you for this opportunity, this time, and this privilege that we've had together. I pray that you would begin to, not, even now, stir the hearts of men and women. That you would do, like the Bible says, that you would turn the hearts of men, women, and children back to you. Because I do believe that we are living in, in, in the latter days and I do believe that we're going to see your glory manifested like we've never seen it before. So right now I pray in the name of your son Jesus that you would, say, that you would save everyone that you can, Lord. That you would bring everyone to you like the way this scripture ended with. That you would bring us together 
like the way a mother hen brings her little chicks together. And Father, that you would abide and dwell among us. And Father, that you would take us into a new level of intimacy and relationship with you. As Moses once said, O oh Lord, show us your glory. I pray that tonight over this over this episode in the mighty unmatchable name of your son jesus christ and to you be the honor the glory and the praise forever and ever amen, amen. we love you god bless you thank you for watching show